Please open your Bibles to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, chapter two. Peter says, speaking to the church, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This morning I spoke to you about the most important event in history, and if you were not here, basically what I said the, was the fact that the resurrection of Jesus uh, was and continues to be and will always be the most important event in the history of mankind and I mentioned for several reasons. One, because it proves that Jesus is divine. Two, uh, His resurrection initiates our faith. It's the spark that ignites the faith that we have. And three, it also produces hope for our own resurrection and our own eternal life. The idea being if God can raise Jesus from the dead, then He can also raise us from the dead. Not only showing us uh, the resurrection of Jesus, but also promising us a similar resurrection. So this evening I want to talk to you about the most important thing in the world. You may think the most important thing, and when I hear people talk about this, you know, when they, well, most important thing is family, for example, or health. My, if you don't have your health, you, know, you can't enjoy anything, people say. Um, you may think, as I say, um, family or health, happiness, all of these things, very important. But more important than these is the church. Not saying these other things are not important, but the most important thing from God's perspective is not how happy we are, how rich we are, if we have a big family or not. The most important thing from God's perspective is the church. In God's eyes, the most precious, the most beautiful thing in all of creation is the church of God. Christ, the church that belongs to Christ, God's people, the saved, the body, all kinds of names that the Bible attributes to the church. And here's why, just cut to the chase, why does God consider the church the most important thing? Well, first of all, it's value. It's the most valuable thing in all of the world. You know, we determine the value of something by its cost, don't we? How much does that cost? Well, I'd like that car, how much does it cost? In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, the Bible says, or Paul says, be on your guard for yourselves and for all of the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The church was purchased not with money or gold, it was purchased with the blood of Christ. This price is beyond any amount of money or any human sacrifice because the blood or the life of Jesus is perfect, it is divine. And so the intrinsic value of Jesus' life is beyond anything that we have in creation, nothing else like it. The value of gold and the value of diamonds can be compared or measured, but there is nothing else on earth that costs a perfect and eternal life in order to purchase. Nothing else costs that. And so all the money or all the souls in the world cannot equal the value of Jesus' life. And so the church is important because it is the most valuable thing in existence. Even the creation of Adam did not require the life of Christ as payment. God did not sacrifice as much for any other thing as He did to establish the church. And so it's the most important thing in all of creation because of its, because of its value. It is also the most important thing 
because of its role. It has the most important purpose. You know, nothing else in the world is tasked with doing what the church is tasked with doing. We read in 1 Timothy chapter three, but in, Paul says, but in case I'm delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the support of the truth. So the church is responsible for maintaining and spreading the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now there is truth in various books, truth taught by schools, every sort of organization and institution, but only the church has been given the mandate to guard and proclaim the truth that can save a person's soul and lead them to eternal life. No other organization has been given that job. No other organization has been tasked with that important responsibility. And so the church is supremely important because of the role it plays and it will continue to play until the, until the end of time. To reveal and to propagate the news of God's offer of forgiveness and eternal life to all who believe Jesus Christ and obey His gospel. That's, you know, as we used to say, that's job number one of the church. And so the church, you know, we can be involved in benevolence work. Many churches are, we do. We provide food and other services, uh, certainly to the congregation, but to many people in our community. All kinds of good works that the church is involved in. You know, the, the, the care packages we send to the troops and the backpacks that we do for students in, 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 in different schools. We, you know, we have potlucks for the, the sports team. All kinds of good and benevolent works that we do. We organize events and we operate schools. We don't, but many churches operate schools, various clinics, all good works, absolutely but its purpose is to be a witness to the world concerning the truth that Jesus Christ is the divine Lord and salvation is found only in Him. That's the job. If all we do is hand out food but don't hand out that message, we failed as the church. We're not, we're not, doing, our, we're not doing our job. In uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Peter says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Is Jesus the only way a person can be saved? Yes. Who says so? The Bible. Where does it say that specifically? Well, it says that specifically in many places, but you can't get it more compact than the way Peter says it in Acts chapter four, verse 12. There's no way that you can twist this scripture. There's no way that you can shuffle this scripture around to make it mean that there is another way to be saved other than Jesus. There's only one conclusion from this verse. No other name under heaven, that excludes everybody, no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Only one, Jesus Christ. Well, what about the 10 million people that depend on this other name, of this other religious figure, person, historical personage? What about all those people? Well, I don't know about those people. All I know is the Bible says only one name given under heaven by which we must be saved. Just one. So the church, as I say, can, 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 can be involved in all kinds of things, but promoting this idea, proclaiming this, that there's only one name by which we can be saved, this is our primary task. You know, political activists and governments, they often cast themselves as the guardians, you know, the guardians of the environment, or the guardians of democracy, or freedom, or our rights to uh, you know, own, own and buy and own guns, or our rights to speak and say what we wish, and there are all kinds of groups protecting those rights, but only the church has the responsibility given to it by God to guard this truth to guard this truth. Sometimes we're upset because they've taken prayer you know, out of school and uh, well, we have a right. L look at what's happening. 
Children are killing other children. Well, if you don't ever teach them the, the commandment that says thou shalt not kill, and you do that for a couple of generations, and they don't learn in their homes thou shalt not kill, and they don't hear in school thou shalt not kill, if they get a mind to kill, there's nothing holding them back. Don't ask yourself why this is happening. Don't ask even how can we prevent it? We go back to teaching people what is right, what is wrong, the will of God. The church is the most important thing in the world also because of its destiny. The importance of someone or something is often measured by its relationship to other important people or other important institutions. For example, if your sister is the governor of the state, well, you might have uh, you know, certain benefits from her positions. You know, if you want to get a job, you know, working for the, the government of the state, if your sister's the governor, you have a pretty good shot at getting in. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, Paul says the following, it is a trustworthy statement for if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. And so no matter what condition the church finds itself in here on earth, whether the church is poor or young or small, whether the church is ignored or persecuted, its final position, its final relationship will be at the right hand of God ruling with Christ over all powers, all spirits, all dominions, even angels and kings and authorities, and will reign in this way forever and ever. The destiny of the church is important. The church is important because no other person or organization has been promised such a position by God. We, we're not just related to some politician, we are related to God who is in heaven. That's a much more powerful, advantageous relationship. No other organism is connected to God in such a dynamic and intimate way. We're connected to God organically because in Colossians 1 verse 18, Paul says we are the body of Christ. He is the head, we are His body. We are related to God organically and we're also connected socially and emotionally because in Ephesians 2 verse 19, Paul says that we are, the church is, God's household. Being someone's household is uh, intimate, right? It's your brother, it's your mother, it's your relatives, it's people of your own blood, your own kin. And so Paul describes the church as the household, the family, if you wish, of God. So I, I, I preach sermons with the hope that they will fulfill certain spiritual needs. When I say I, every preacher preaches with, he has a target, he has objectives in mind. So this lesson was given so that you might become more aware of how truly important the church is to God. Never mind if the church is not important to the local government. Never mind if the church doesn't seem to be important to the, to the, to the community. That's not how we measure its value. Its value is measured by how important it is to God. And that's the point I'm trying to get across tonight. This congregation, for example, is the most important thing in this town. Better everything else should shut down before this church shuts down. Because it is the most important thing to God we need to remember certain things. First of all, we cannot please or serve God outside the church. The Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23 says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. What's the confession of our hope? My hope is that through Christ I will live eternally. So he says, let, let, let's, let's hang on to that confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised, promised what? Promised us eternal life. For he who promised is faithful. 
and let us consider how to stimulate one another. Who's one another? It's you, it's me, it's they, it's them. Let us continue, right, to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And what else should we do, says the author? Not forsaking our assembling together. What's that assembling together? Let's not forsake being the church, coming together as the church, as is the habit of some. What had happened here? Well, the some were Christians, but what the habit they got into, they got into the habit of not assembling together. And so the writer says, don't get into the habit of not assembling together. Continue the habit of assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Well, the day drawing near can mean the day, the Lord's day, or it can mean the judgment day. As you see the Lord's day slash judgment day, you, the church, ought to encourage one another not to forsake the assembling together as a church. Why? Because the church is the most important thing in the eyes of God. Why? Because in the church you are reminded of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you and I are reminded at the church that we also will resurrect with Christ one day. You don't get that reminder at Walmart <laughs> right? At Walmart, you, 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 you get to see the, the latest trends in the public wearing of pajamas, but you don't, <laughs> you don't get the reminder that you are an eternal being at Walmart, and the government doesn't remind you of this. You, you're reminded of this when you come together as a church, very important. And so uh, our value, our role, uh, the greatest fulfillment uh, are developed and realized within the context of the church. It's the only place where Christ is. If you are outside the church, then you are also outside of Christ and you are outside of His purpose for you. Secondly, the church is important and because it is important, belonging to the church is the same thing as being saved. When someone refuses to belong to the church, what they're actually refusing is salvation. You know in the book of Acts, familiar passage where Peter is preaching to the crowd on Pentecost Sunday and and when he preaches the gospel to them, they ask him, uh, men and brethren, what should we do? And what does he say? Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then it keeps going on and on, and down in verse uh, 247, it says the church was praised, all those who had been baptized, they were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who are being saved. When someone refuses to belong to the church, as I say, they're refusing salvation. There are two ways of saying the same thing. If you say I'm a member of the church, you're saying I'm a member of the body, you're also saying I'm saved. When someone is cut off from the church because of sinfulness, they're also cut off from Christ and His salvation as well. You cannot be a body member without being a member of the body. <laughs> I mean, it goes together. For example, if my arm is infected with some poison and the doctors amputate my arm as a result and my arm is laying there on the table after the surgery, and you look at my arm, you know what? That's still my arm. That's not the doctor's arm, that's my arm. But it is no longer connected to my body and therefore it can no longer function as my arm. Yeah, it's my arm, but it doesn't work anymore. It will eventually rot and disintegrate into dust while the rest of me goes on living without it. I may be a one-armed man, but I'm a living one-armed man. My arm that I left behind, however, is not good for anything else anymore. 
When Jesus returns, He's going to return to find and reward with eternal life His church, His faithful church. Remember I've told you, He's not coming back to look for the biggest church or the flashiest church. He's coming back to find the faithful church. The key word is faithful. The unfaithful, those who have been cut away, dropped away, or never added, they will perish. Second Thessalonians uh, chapter one, verses uh, six to 10 read, for after all it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God, that's one group, and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. To those individuals who reject the idea that there's no such thing as hell, and that is a kind of a comforting idea, they have a little bit of a problem with this particular passage here. To, to interpret this passage and, and wish away the existence of hell. And he says, these will pay the uh, penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when it comes to be glorified in His saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. The faithful will rejoice and the unfaithful will suffer. This is what we call a hard truth. It's a hard truth. Why do we say it's a hard truth? Because even if we believe and even if we are faithful, it still hurts to think that there are some who are unfaithful who will be lost. I personally take no pleasure in anyone being lost. I take no pleasure in, in, in whole groups of people being lost. Thankfully, God has not given to any of us the responsibility of judgment. He has only given to us the responsibility of proclamation. And this we must do so that we can stand before Him in good conscience, not because we condemned anybody, but because we did what we could to proclaim the good news so that everyone would have an opportunity to receive the eternal life that we have received and humbly accept through Christ uh, our Lord. And so it's a hard truth, but it's a truth nevertheless. Uh, one other thing to remember, because the church is important, believers will never fully experience the joy and the peace that comes from knowing God and Jesus, His Son, until they begin loving and serving the church. I've made this into a little math thing here because I don't have enough room on the slide to put the whole thing on. But basically you get it. Love plus service equals joy and peace in the church. In 2 Timothy chapter four we read, but you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. I was telling someone else, and Hal and I talk about this all the time, you know, for Bible talk, the bigger it grows, the more expensive it is to, to, you know, to, to support the thing. You know, when, you have, when you have a million viewers, when you have a million minutes of, of watch time per month, when you have over 100,000 visitors, that means there are people asking questions, that means they have to be answered, that means we, we, you know, we have to have people who, who type the closed captions and do the translate. You know, the bigger it gets, the more expensive it gets to support the thing. Well, we have to find the money to do that. And you know, we go out and I preach in different places. I'm going to Tennessee next weekend and a couple of more weeks I'm going up to Lot and all you know, for, for, for Bible talk. And that gets, that gets uh, burdensome sometimes. Because every year we start at zero. Is everybody going to be with us in 2018? Will we lose all our support in 2019? We won't be able to continue. And I have to thank Hal, he's the one that exhorts me. And from his exhortation, I write down on my to-do list, I don't know about you guys, a little to-do list, you know, appointment here Tuesday, call so-and-so Thursday, whatever. At the top of my to-do list, 
Every week when I make it up, I write the following words. Just do the work. Let the Lord provide. Just do the work. Let the Lord provide. Hasn't He provided? Almost 40 years of full-time ministry, has He always provided? Yes. What are you worried about? Just do the work. Let the Lord provide. Paul continues to speak to him. He says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith, in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved His appearing. Paul just did the work and let the Lord provide for him. I believe Paul could face a cruel and unjust death with joy and confidence because he was assured that giving up his life for the church, he was offering it for something that was worthwhile. For example, the church is priceless in value and so his life was not wasted. He was giving up his life for something that was priceless. The church was unique in its purpose and so his life had meaning. How many people have I spoken to who have gone into ministry and who said, you know, I just, I, uh, I just can't see myself selling another thing or making another widget or you know, I, I need to go and preach the gospel. They see no purpose in what they're doing. They, they must leave and go and proclaim the gospel. Paul wasn't just leaving something to go preach the gospel. He was about to give his life for the gospel. And when he looked at the church, when he examined the thing that he had worked for and, and suffered for, he realized that this, this church was unique. And so his life had meaning. Even if it was to end, it was okay. And of course, the church is eternal in its destiny. And so Paul had hope beyond this life. Not just, he wasn't serving just a movement that would you know, perish once he was gone. He was, he was sure that the, the, the thing that he served would continue on long after he was gone, would continue on until the end of time. And so his life was intertwined with the life of the body. And if the body was eternal, so would his life be. And so is our own lives. How many of us spend so much of our time searching for meaning and purpose and direction for our lives in the things of this world and we continually come up short and dissatisfied, disillusioned, discouraged, depressed? When will we learn that the yearning for a spiritually meaningful, valuable, eternal contribution of our lives and talents can only be satisfied in service to God, worked out through our service to the church. I don't mean everybody's got to quit their jobs and be preachers. Some do, some do it. I did it, Marty did it, others did it. Doesn't mean everybody has to do it. But at some point, at some point, our life finally finds its meaning in how we interact with God's church and how we serve it, no matter how we serve it. You know, the church is the most important thing in the world and because this is so, we cannot be saved, we cannot please God, and we cannot reach our full spiritual potential outside of the church. And so this evening, therefore, I offer four invitations on behalf of the church. Invitation number one, if you're not a member of God's church, then I encourage you to allow Christ to add you to His household through repentance and baptism. That is always the invitation. Why, why are we always inviting you know, all the time? Because the church is the most important thing and our own resurrection will become the most important event in our lives. 
it is worthwhile to repeat once or twice a week at least the invitation to be added to the church and to guarantee your eternal life in Christ Jesus. Invitation number two, return to the church. If you've fallen away from the body because of neglect or sin, you, know, you can be separated from the body and still be sitting in the pew. <laughs> I've seen that a lot of times. Some people make the mistake that if they attend worship, it means they're okay with the entire church and the Lord. Not exactly the same thing. If you want to be sure that you are a member of the church in good standing, and you have sinned or if you've neglected the church, you've just not been the Christian you know you need to be. I can't judge that. Only two people can judge that. That's you and the Lord. And so if that's a decision that you need to make, to be restored to the church, then let's do it. Come forward, repent, ask the elders to pray for you, to help you, to support you. Invitation number three. If you are a baptized believer in our you know, new to the area or you've just been visiting us and you'd like to identify yourself with our congregation, I say give us the right hand of fellowship, allow the elders of this congregation to be those who oversee your life, who shepherd you. We need to know that Then make that known tonight. And finally, if you need the prayers of the church for any reason, but specifically, if you need the prayers of the church to be stronger in your faith, stronger in your hope that resurrection is what you are aiming for, is what you're going towards. If you need the prayers of the church because you need to be a better, fill in the blank, okay? A better son, a better daughter, a better husband, better wife, better child, better worker, better, you know. We all, have, we all can fill in that blank with something different. But if you need the prayers of the church in order to help you be that better person, then come. There's no shyness here. We are the family of God, the household of God. We're supposed to be able to share with one another not only our strengths and our victories, but our weaknesses as well and our defeats also. Usually when someone who has failed badly comes forward, I have found, this is just anecdotal here, no scripture, just my own opinion. I have found that that many times is much more powerful in affecting the faith of the brethren than the sermon I just preached. Because we see that person have the courage to come forward and say, I want to confess Christ and be baptized. Or that person comes forward and says, I've not been living right and I want to do right and I need the help of the church to, to strengthen me to do right. That encourages everyone else because they're saying, hey, if that, that person there that I thought had everything going for them, I thought they had everything together, if they need the help of the church, who am I to stand back? Who am I to continually put off asking for the prayers of the elders and the church. So if you are uh, needing to answer any one of those, and if I've left one out, well, I, <laughs> the, the unknown reason to come forward, then I encourage you to do that now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.